So welcome everyone. My name is Nicola Chabot and I'm a program manager for new mobility at MTC. Um, and I'm really excited today as we're going to discuss specifically how we transition successful COVID era street redesigns to pilot, interim and permanent projects. We are going to be discussing recommended processes, practices, designs, material and outreach strategies to ensure these transitions work for residents, the general public and implementing agencies. And this webinar is brought to you by the Design and Project Delivery Group within the Operations Division of MTC. Our section focuses on low-hanging fruit, specifically pilot projects, transportation demand management, and mode shift operational strategies in addition to quick build and complete streets. And so, um, just want to spend a few minutes talking about the webinar goals. Uh, so here at MTC, we've been getting a lot of questions in terms of what's next. What are the next steps that we take um, during these COVID era um, street redesigns that we've been seeing implemented throughout the Bay Area? So this is really to continue discussions on how to transition um, these successful street demonstrations and temporary installations to those pilot interim and permanent projects. Um, MTC is also here to further support quick build as a project delivery method and introduce best practices from relevant historical treatments to current efforts. And so many of you may be familiar with um, some of the treatments to the right, such as the diagonal diverters in Berkeley, California. Um, but these are an example of a more permanent uh, uh, traffic calming implementation. And so we also want to look at those interim improvements like the one you can see at the bottom, these diagonal diverters um, from recently implemented in the city of Seattle. So um, this is really about transitioning um, through these uh, different types of treatments. Um, MTC is also here to notify you about potential funding opportunities, such as the safe and seamless quick strike uh, opportunity that's coming up. And um, I'm going to encourage you all to contact Toshi or I uh, after this presentation if you're interested in learning more about that funding opportunity. We may have some budget available for supporting you with further um, design uh, or one-on-one -on -one as technical assistance for uh, quick build projects. Um, and so our agenda for today is really, we're gonna be going over um, emerging street types and operational strategies uh, that we have uh, seen been implemented um, in the Bay Area and actually all over North America and the world. <laughs> Um, and we're also going to go into kind of the rationale um, and the um, strategies you can use to make um, hardening initiatives more defensible for slow streets, which is really important. Um, we're going to uh, discuss how to go from pilot to permanent and talk a little bit about the importance of community outreach um, and engagement through all of this. Um, and uh, Gwen is also going to talk specifically about hardening strategies and treatments, and we're also going to go over several precedents and case studies and lessons learned. Um, and so today I'm happy to introduce our team from Tool Design Group. Um, I'll introduce Jessica Zadeb first. Um, Jessica AICP has experienced planning for walking and bicycling at scales ranging from corridor to campus to region, always considering their interaction with other roadway users. She has led numerous bicycle and pedestrian plans to create connected networks that enable people to walk and bike to school, work and other destinations. Through years of close work with engineering colleagues, Jessica also brings a designer's understanding of space and feasibility to her planning projects, leading to plans and planning processes that consider implementation from the outset. Next, we have Jeremy Charzan, uh, PE, PTOE, Lead AP. He's a professional engineer with over 20 years of experience in transportation, municipal, and site engineering projects. As Tool Design's multimodal design practice lead, 
Jeremy works to encourage design innovation and develop best practices that address bicyclist and pedestrian safety. His uh, past design, permitting, and construction experience, along with technical knowledge of design standards, allow him to identify practical solutions to accommodate multiple modes of transportation, including motor vehicles, mass transit, pedestrians, and cyclists. Jeremy is the lead engineer for the forthcoming update to the Ashto Bike Guide and is working on rapid implementation projects in cities across the country. And finally, we have Gwen Shaw, EIT. Gwen is an engineer with experience in both <clears throat> the public and private sector thinking about designing streets for people. Her experience includes bikeway design, bike share station siting, permitting, pedestrian improvements, and safe routes to school design and planning. She has worked on a handful of bicycle and pedestrian plans to create safe and connected networks that enable people to access key destinations without the necessity of a motor vehicle. Additionally, Gwen brings a background in planning, designing, and implementing temporary demonstration projects for alternative uses of public space through her volunteer work with Better Block PDX, a local nonprofit organization. And with that, I will let the Tool Design Group team take it away. Great, thanks, Nicola. We're really happy to be here to present with MTC again. Um, so we are gonna be talking about moving from pilot to permanent, um, and especially in this time where a lot of jurisdictions have been taking advantage of this crazy year and making some exciting uh, changes to their streetscapes. So we'll talk through a couple trends um, that we've been seeing throughout this past year in reaction to coronavirus. And there are really two big avenues that we're going to um, split these treatments and projects up into today. The first is residential and local streets. And I think folks are probably most familiar with this intervention street type. This is a soft closure. A lot of communities have been implementing these uh, with uh, temporary, very, very temporary pop-up materials, you know, scrounging around the warehouse and seeing what's on hand, um, everything from sawhorses to cones to barrels, and implementing these as quickly as you can to make sure that space is provided for people to safely recreate in their neighborhoods outdoors and far enough away from another, one another to be um, safe with public health protocols. So uh, residential streets are one side. And then when we kind of start moving up in street classifications, thinking about places where uh, people who walk and bike need more protection and separation from automobiles, we're thinking about uh, collectors and arterials here. So cities have been taking advantage of this time as well to transition curb lanes, whether that is a parking lane or um, a travel lane to space for people to walk, bike, scoot, um, just move by other means. And in a lot of places, obviously, we're also seeing these curb lanes converted to places uh, for outdoor dining um, when that is allowed. Uh, another aspect that's been really interesting to see, and this is something that Oakland in particular has piloted with their essential places arm of their Slow Streets program is uh, interventions at locations that are really critical, uh, critical places for people to get in these times, whether that is a health clinic or a grocery store or just a corner market um, that's located on a street that really needs uh, better access and safer access uh, because it is a larger street and could benefit from something like the treatment that's shown here, which is an interim treatment for curb extensions and a median island that really highlights that mid-block crossing uh, that gets people safely just within their neighborhood across a busy street. Um, and then lastly, we also know that there have been interventions um, on the operational side of things. So changes to um, signal cycle lengths, phasing, um, going from uh, a push button recall on a pedestrian sign or pedestrian signal to an automatic walk phase. And these are things that um, obviously don't have a physical impact on the ground, but are really operationally helping people get around more safely um, in these times. And uh, it's, been, it's been really exciting and interesting to see the amount of interest in these interventions around the country, as Nicholas said, actually really around the world. And there are lots of other resources out there that are compiling um, these interventions, making really cool visualizations, um, just calling attention to both the actual interventions themselves and the considerations around them. So um, thinking very critically about what does it mean to be doing this 
in communities? What does it mean um, to be working with communities to implement these projects successfully? So I would point you to all of those resources and this presentation will be sent out afterwards. Um, so the purpose and need of these, um, obviously the public health, uh, public health need is probably top of mind for a lot of folks and just making sure that there's enough space, as I said, for people to be outside and recreate and travel safely um, near one another, but not too near one another. So we're, it really all comes back to these kind of fundamental network planning principles for transportation networks generally. Um, you know, we talk mostly about people walking and biking, uh, but this actually also really applies to other modes. So safety, comfort, and connectivity are kind of the baseline that we always think of when uh, planning a network for people moving around uh, their communities. And it applies, as I said, to active and transit modes. You know, in this time, we know that there have certainly been service cutbacks. Um, we've got the core service plan for the city of San Francisco up there on the screen, but people are still taking transit and every person who takes transit has to um, get to and from that stop. So we know that um, prioritizing safe access and these intervention projects in tandem with transit um, can really be beneficial to continuing to support that mode in this time when, when transit agencies uh, are, are having a more difficult time. Um, but we do know that these needs are not going to evaporate um, once we're sort of back to normal, um, whenever that may be. And so what we really need to start thinking about is how we move along this continuum. Um, Many of the projects that uh, have been in place um, use those types of materials that are there under the pop-up um, phase of this process. But we know that things have been in place probably now for way more than one month, which is what we have listed as the time frame for those materials. And um, some materials as well have fallen into um, the the pilot list there but we know that um, cities are going to be wanting to move along this continuum and so we're here today to to talk about um, what it's going to look like to move from pop-up to pilot to quick build and permanent and the thing to note here is that um, this really is can be an iterative process throughout some of these phases sometimes it is easy um, in terms of your materials to make changes to walk back to to uh, take feedback from the community and tweak things as you hear um, what they're thinking and how it's working for them, or if you're actually seeing um, changes to, to speeds or to traffic volumes or diversion. Um, but once you're walking along the step to permanency, that's actually where you're going to you know, stop making changes um, and really need to get things right. So we're gonna talk about um, what that means as well and in, in the steps that you need to take to get there. So just quickly, um, what do these projects look like? They can physically look pretty different from one another, um, but they can serve uh, multiple modes at one time. So these are just examples from both Minneapolis and Baltimore. The Baltimore project um, really created a critical connection between a community and a large park um, that served to be one of the only connections across a major freeway in the city. And so um, this was something that uh, really opened up um, that that healthy uh, connection to um, an outdoor activity space. Um, we also see these projects happening, especially in Vision Zero cities um, like Memphis and Seattle, where you are trying to make pedestrians a lot more visible at um, crossings. You're trying to slow down the turning uh, speeds of vehicles with an extension like that. And at the same time, um, some of these projects are also really thinking about how they can um, just brighten up the streets and um, give the opportunity to bring a little bit of vibrancy to a neighborhood. And I think Gwen's going to talk a little bit about that more later. Um, some cities have actually moved forward in building entire networks with uh, materials that may look and seem and feel a little bit more temporary, but actually are uh, creating that connected network that makes a huge change and impact on ridership, especially on the bike side of things. So in Calgary, a lot of their downtown network has been built out with materials like this, um, concrete curb stops that are pinned to asphalt, flex posts, um, and markings um, that have just changed the, uh, changed the way that people feel about riding bikes in downtown Calgary. Um, I will note that you'll see a bike symbol, or sorry, a bike signal on this slide as well, which um, we fully understand that that is not a um, low effort or low cost or necessarily quick thing to work into changing your signal phasing um, 
So we do acknowledge that there are certainly parts of implementing projects like this that do need um, a lot more concerted thinking uh, just beyond the materials that are on the ground. So throughout coronavirus, um, the implementation authority has really been uh, done kind of under this emergency status where you're thinking about what is the thing that we can do very quickly to react to public health guidance and make sure that our communities are able to stay safe. Um, and those are emergency response powers that are located um, pretty high up the chain um, with elected officials and you know traffic engineers. But um, what we wanted to talk about here is that, you know, this is hopefully we're not going to be in an emergency forever, right? Someday um, this is going to end and we'll need to figure out how we move along um, and keep some of these projects in place um, after that's ended. And so you really need to think about relying on evaluation of your program and um, getting the data driven analysis to show need and interest. Um, Gwen will talk a little bit about that in terms of outreach as well. Um, and really importantly, looking to align with policies um, where those goals are going to enable you to fight against any kind of pushback that you might find. So, so many communities throughout the Bay Area have put in place active transportation plans that you can draw upon to start thinking about these networks. Um, here in Portland, uh, where Gwen and I are located, the city moved forward with some of their quick implementation projects um, in these last couple of months, really based on existing neighborhood greenways. And so on the left side of the screen there, the green lines are greenways that have already been implemented and the red dots were diversion interventions. And so you see in a couple places there, there are lines of red dots without any green lines accompanying them. And those are places where the city had already planned neighborhood greenways. And so they implemented diversion soft closures during this time um, and kind of setting it upon the policy basis of already having designated those as neighborhood greenways um, that will be moving towards permanence over time. Um, just a couple photo examples of what that's looked like um, on the left is what a permanent um, diversion looks like on one of our neighborhood greenways, uh, enabling cyclists to pass through, um, but not allowing through traffic. Those two side streets um, that comprise the greenway are right in, right out. And then um, one of the temporary installations on the left. Um, San Francisco has uh, taken an approach like this as well, um, where they've implemented 25 slow streets since April and first hardening treatment going in today um, at 20th uh, in the mission. And they are working with, um, it looks, I actually can't tell if those are epoxy adhered to the street or not. Um, someone from the city might be able to, to tell us that or maybe Nicola, but um, they're working on doing a bit of hardening of these uh, these streets in the city as well. And um, we know that Oakland also took a, took a very similar approach to what Portland did in soft closures on a lot of existing planned neighborhood greenways. And the thing that that enables you to do is, you know, look back at all of the outreach that was done for an active transportation plan um, and say, you know, we really talked to the community thought with them through this um, and, and are relying upon that policy basis um, to make some of these first interventions. However, we know that actually there have been a lot of community discussions in cities throughout the Bay Area as well and reactions to these programs. And so it's not as if you can just sit and um, rely only upon the policy and planning that's happened to date. You also are gonna need to continue on with outreach and engagement and um, being really transparent about what um, the program is doing right now, and also um, looking back and reminding people about those conversations that were had uh, in the past. And so Gwen's going to talk about some strategies for community outreach um, during coronavirus. Yeah, and I want to highlight before I go to the next slide, just to see that there are um, examples that we've seen of community outreach being done during COVID. So these are a couple of pictures in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where they held an open streets event with social distancing um, and kind of safe, safe strategies for um, getting that input in, in real person. Um, I messed up unmuting myself. Give me one second. Um, to kind of continue on with the strategies for community outreach, there's some 
key principles, um, as Jess just alluded to, that communities should be involved kind of before, during, and after the projects, and that the partnerships that you build with community members and groups will need to be maintained as the project evolves, um, kind of informally or formally. So you can set up agreements with local bids, um, or you can just kind of rely on local, you know, destinations in the community that are already hotspots for activity, um, not in the bad, not in a COVID hotspot, but just a way um, where people are are coming and going um, and using that as a opportunity to collect information and um, build those relationships. Here's an example um, from Oakland. Oakland has been doing this since April and kind of midway through has they they took a pause and um, evaluated kind of where where things were got where things were at. So um, this slide highlights some of the so far they've implemented slow streets, engaged with the community and then adapted the program um, as they are adjusting, basic, as they're collecting feedback um, and listening to that feedback. That's when they added in the essential, essential places program in addition to just the slow streets to really focus on the needs that the community identified. Um, the next steps are really to just kind of continue on in that engagement. So the next slide shows um, the an open map. There's a survey and this uh, participatory online map that is still open. So the previous slide kind of showed some summaries of a, of a midpoint, um, but these, these surveys and online maps are still open for the community. Um, and this the dashboard on the right is a live um, dashboard of the information to kind of just show, you know, the responses that they're getting, what the information is, uh, where it's coming from. So Oakland has done a really good job of, you know, listening to the community and implementing those changes um, as needed. Wanted to highlight another example. We talked about Calgary um, a little bit earlier and how they really focused on building a network as opposed to just projects throughout. Um, we really like this, this set of information, um, the tone of 311 calls received. Um, similar to Oakland, Calgary opened up the 311 line to have people call in um, and provide input, input. And so this one goes, you know, as the um, as the cycle tracks were opened, you can see down on the, the bottom of the screen, it kind of shows where they open. There was a large input of data, both positive and negative calls were coming in. And then as time went on, um, kind of both, both positive and negative calls leveled out and stopped coming in as much. And it really just goes to show that, you know, the initial change um, is real. And then there's, you have to kind of overcome that fear and um, work with the community to expand. Um, kind of going to go through a few different strategies. These are some of the typical ones that we've seen. There's um, virtual or in-person surveys. Uh, you can use quick builds as engagement. So you, here you can see that they did a pop-up traffic circle and the little kids were able to enjoy it um, potentially while parents or family members were providing input um, in that informal survey option. You can also work with the community groups to um, help with the demonstration. It can really build the engagement and kind of the sense of ownership that community feels. It also provides really good opportunities to give the community input on design choices that they actually can, you know, that they have um, the ability to impact. So some details are more technical and may not be able to be, um, you know, determined by the community, but if you can provide input or provide options for things that they can input, such as the colors, color schemes or patterns like that, they can really feel ownership um, over the projects to the extent that's possible. A couple other options, we've seen these here in Portland. Um, there's these on the ground stickers. So here's one um, at one of the busy streets, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second, where they have a pop-up curb extension and there's the sticker. You can text the number with the code um, to provide input, there's different stickers, different codes for the different implementations. So if you're at a healthy business, one of the open outdoor dining, um, there would be a code specific to provide input on that. And those codes are available via SMS, so just regular text messages, don't necessarily require a smartphone or internet. So they can um, help address and help reach groups that might otherwise not see some of the online forms. Um, speaking of online forums, here's a virtual charrette. We've seen a lot of success with this uh, through the pandemic so far. A lot of different um, programs are coming out. This The slide here is Miro, which is um, basically an online whiteboard where you can use interactively. Each person could kind of drag and drop, drag and drop as they were on um, the call. And so it was really great for informal 
um, and formal meetings to kind of brainstorm with each other. Um, another one I talked about the participatory, participatory online maps for Oakland. Here's an example of some of the you know, the information you can get from those maps. Here's one from San Francisco um, where they were collecting input on the central subway expansion and they were able to see, you know, they had a hot, they had a ton of um, comments come from the study area and then they were able to kind of see where this is showing where people live. And so they were able to kind of see where people live. There were similar maps for where people work to really understand who's providing the input. And you can take this information along with the information you're gathering to kind of continue or um, inform your analysis. So just wanted to show those um, engagements for community engagement um, before we get into the hardening treatments. So we showed this slide um, a bit more er, earlier, and today we're going to focus a little bit on kind of this next, this quick build to permanent phase. Um, so here we've highlighted, this is from the LA Los Angeles Supplemental um, Guidance, which we'll highlight again in a little bit. Um, and this shows, you know, three different, there's the paint and post um, parking protected bike lane precast concrete curbs in the middle, and then cast in place concrete down on the bottom. And it really just kind of shows the evolution um, of the design and how you can test in the early stages. And then towards the end, it kind of informs the final design um, to really expand. These next few slides, we're going to go over um, some of the materials that, can you, that you can use um, MTC also has a good uh, matrix of options on their website that you can kind of point to that um, can, so this is meant to supplement. So at the very high level, you can kind of see the pros, cons, the durability um, continues on, or gets, it gets more durable as you expand through the process and the cost goes up. The quick um, paint and post are quick to install, precast can be quick to install, but there are some limitations in the design and implementation. Um, and then the full build can take a bit longer, the per, um, there's construction phase, and it can be built in development, um, in partnership with developments. This is just another example kind of showing the cost, the cost impact and the differences, um, as well as a photo just to kind of highlight what these things look like in um, paint and precast concrete up in Houston on the top right, and then full build concrete um, in the bottom right in Chicago. Um, looking at the cost difference, 10 miles in two years um, using the better bikeways, um, kind of using that quick build approach, costs about $1.3 million. Um, the capital project example, you know, one mile about five years and $11 million. So these, this is just one example of order of magnitude um, and we're happy to go into more during questions and answers um, and, and as we go. Um, here's the slide from MTC that I was noting um, and then kind of going into more details on some of these. Um, here's the barriers. There are a lot of options that you can choose from and a lot of the times it will come down to what um, you know, what the acquisition is like, what the comfort of the reviewing engineer team is like, um, what the feasibility of acquiring, how much they cost, and just what the overall desire is. So this is, um, shows the variety and how long they can last, um, kind of looking at the MUTCD barricades, typically one month, one day to one month. Those are usually what we see in construction, but they are definitely more for the pop-ups that we've been seeing um, so as you kind of expand from that, there's options such as Jersey barriers, like you see in New York um, here, and you can even decorate those and work with the community to do that. Um, Seattle down in the bottom right uses paint and posts, which can be added. You can get um, planters such as the one over on the far left can also be kind of the next, the next phase of that. Denver is shown um, the right middle, um, bottom middle, um, you can see that they've also used concrete uh, planter or concrete um, barriers. Um, there's several different options. Looking at the next um, set of content, there's also signs. So you can get signs professionally made. You can use MUTCD signs that you may have um, and the sign shop. There's also um, 
the bottom right shows the bottom left excuse me shows an example from portland during the pop-up version of the project it was you know laminated paper on um, cones and then they actually printed these are high vis high visibility retro reflective um, signs that were attached bolted into the pre or into the um, flex posts for a um, kind of the next step quick build version and concrete will be next step um, going forward. San Francisco, you can see that they, um, in this example, have put the floating um, stop sign to kind of really define this treatment at the intersection, which can be done instead of just deferring to the typical locations um, on the curb. Materials summary, um, this is something, you know, edge lines and striping is something that a lot of city crews and contractors do typically, um, but these are showing um, some of those quick build um, options that can be done in those phases up to that. Um, there is traffic tape that can be done, that can be implemented or spray paint or spray chalk with stencils and paint lines um, can be quite durable though should definitely um, defer to what contractor crews um, will do. As for, in terms of the decorations, we talked a lot about some of the, um, you know, the communities can select the colors and help be involved with those. There's a really great asphalt art guide um, that Bloomberg Cities helps produce that goes into a ton of case studies um, showing the lifetime and durability of these different materials. A lot of them use temp or a lot of them use acrylic paints um, and there's or uh, dyed concrete paints is another form. And so these are all this guide is really great to go into more information on that. Um, we're going to get into the lane reallocation. So this is the one where Jess was talking about earlier on um about transforming the curb lanes whether that's a travel lane or a parking lane and extending it to space for people walking and biking um, potentially for queuing up for businesses so these are um some of the key things are that you should maintain shy distances from vertical elements um, the operating space of travel lanes can be narrowed to provide the shy distance if needed um, in general, reducing the travel lane width slows vehicles and can provide that additional space. Um, so here's an example in Minneapolis. Um, and then here's uh, an example in Portland taking that a little bit further um, and showing um, the curbs or the, the wave racks on the left, um, which is used for both bikes and pedestrians, and then also the transit island that they are building with asphalt. Um, and you, can, you can't tell very well in this, but there is a pipe running along the curb. So drainage is considered in this um, temporary or in this interim quick build treatment um, to provide space for more people to um, queue and wait at the bus stop while public, while social distancing. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy to kind of finish out the hardening treatment section um, and then share information on some precedents and lessons learned. Thanks, Gwen. Um, so yeah, when, when we're talking about traffic calming, we're often looking at controlling uh, speeds or volumes or both, and that we're generally looking to get those motorist volumes down to the 1,000 to 1,500 range. You can go up as high as 3,000, but that starts to get um, a little less comfortable. Uh, for a point of comparison, the city of Portland uses 500 as their preferred volume. So less is always going to be better in terms of um, accommodating that comfort and then trying to get those speeds down to uh, 20 miles an hour or less to have that shared space environment. So the types of diverters, um, there's a lot of tools in the toolkit. Um, we'll go through some of these. You can find resources in NACTO and other design guides to sort of help you to, to navigate this, this process, but um, they generally want to be wide enough to still be porous for a bicyclist while um, being able to physically prevent the motorists from um, navigating through those spaces. Um, so this is an example of one of those diagonal diverters. Um, I think we had a photo earlier on as well showing this. Um, 
And so you can kind of go through like a quick build implementation of these and just drop in planters um, and then sort of incrementally work your way up to more permanent features. So painting them, making them more decorative. And then as you um, get the funding and the support, um, making those more permanent with the, the curb and other vegetation. Uh, the horizontal deflections, um, this is to deflect the motor, ve motor uh, deflect the motor vehicle without um, forcing the bicyclist to really um, change their path of travel. If you go to the next slide. Um, so uh, an example here might be a neighborhood traffic circle. Um, it's going to slow down the motorists while not really slowing down the bicyclists as much and also slowing down those motorists where pedestrians are trying to cross. And then simple horizontal chicanes. This can be done by flipping parking from one side of the street or to the other or being very deliberate with the placement of things like Green Street infrastructure um, to create those physical bump outs. One guide I wanted to point you to as a good reference is the city of Los Angeles. They recently released this supplemental street design guide. This is something that we worked with them on. And at the end of this in the appendices are all the standard details that we developed to help them navigate the challenges of drainage and implementation while factoring in uh, access for pedestrians and bicyclists, transit access, all the things that we need to be thinking about to keep that street operating while getting those turning vehicle speeds down um, or better achieving the goals that we talked about earlier. Um, and again, you can sort of incrementally work through these improvements. A neighborhood traffic circle can be done with just a little bit of buildup of um, asphalt and pavement markings. And then as you uh, get the funding, adding the vegetation and other features that sort of make that a more permanent feature. Um, this is an example just from Europe, but a really good one of the use of planters and how they can be used to create that chicane or horizontal deflection, very effective at helping to control motor vehicle speeds. And I love this example. Uh, I believe this one's from Cambridge or Boston, uh, flipping the, the parking from one side of the street to the other to create quite an abrupt change in um, horizontal geometry. But again, very effective at helping to control the speeds of motor vehicles. And in installations like this, we actually had one in Houston that we did and added some uh, raised markings to the center line to sort of prevent vehicles from cutting that, cor that corner. So if you find that that's an issue, you can always add more treatments later to better achieve that goal. Vertical deflection, um, this can be a, a challenge in some places, but should still always be considered. Um, often we're talking about speed cushions or thing, raised cr uh, crosswalks, things of that nature that change the elevation of the roadway, but also generally means that we need to be including emergency services, particularly the fire chief, in those discussions if you're required to do so. Um, there's certainly treatments that you can use, the gaps in the speed humps to allow the um, ambulance or fire trucks tires to get through there. Um, but again, you, you, you need to be coordinating if you're using these sorts of treatments as part of your implementations. Um, raised crossings or speed humps can be employed at intersections or mid-block. Um, if you look to examples such as in Europe, you'll find that a raised crossing at an intersection or just changing the elevation of the, um, the side streets is something that's fairly common there. Um, as we're working through making upgrades to our streets, we can sort of incrementally start to think about those sorts of changes with raised crossings or raised intersections as sort of the, um, the next level of implementation for those projects. And again, coordinating with emergency services is incredibly important. I encourage us to be doing this very early on in the life of the project to make sure that we understand what um, their challenges are and make sure that we're deliberately discussing the sort of shared goals that we have, that these types of implementations that we're recommending are focused on reducing vehicle speeds and redu reducing the severity of crashes, which are often the types of things that they're um, responding to. And so working to find solutions that work to achieve both that goal of 
providing them access while um, sort of achieving uh, those speed and volume goals. And I do want to point you to this reference. Um, there was a NACTO webinar from 2018 with the city of Portland's fire chief. We worked closely with, it, with them when we were working on um, Portland separated bike lane guide and sort of a no nonsense down to earth approach to balancing all the needs of the street and finding solutions that work well. So some precedents and lessons learned as, as these types of programs have been implemented, we're seeing what works and what doesn't and sort of using that process to help us identify good locations to um, maybe do the next level of implementation. So Seattle has two different categories. There are stay healthy streets that are really sort of neighborhood uh, greenway streets or low volume residential streets. Um, and finding ways to make them only open to local traffic, whereas the keep moving streets, these are partnerships with um, Seattle's park and rec group um, to identify streets for closure or changing those streets. And um, the implementations that have been done during COVID have allowed the um, community to build support around some of these treatments and um, Seattle's DOT director has committed to um, funding uh, up to around 20 miles of permanent treatments for these types of, of streets to move forward. Another thing to remind you of is that perfect is the enemy of the good. When we're doing full capital improvement projects, these are projects that are going to be permanent and we have to get them right or sort of make expensive changes later on. But for rapid implementation type projects, we have the ability to get the stuff on the ground. And if we're seeing that there are problems, make minor changes. And you still can do some um, capital improvement type projects. This is an image from our Houston project. And on the north side, you can see we did some sidewalk improvements to do um, some, some access improvements there. On the right where the orange color is, we were doing some pavement repair because the pavement condition was just so poor. But you got to pick and choose your battles and put the money where it provides the most benefit and um, know that you can come back later and make those changes. I could do a whole webinar on what's been going on in Houston right now. Um, the key takeaways from this project are, number one, that it has really significant political support. This was the sort of the brainchild of Commissioner Ellis and had the mayor's support to build 50 lane or 50 miles of low stress bike networks in the span of a year. And this was a, a goal that we achieved by number one, having a strong kickoff meeting where we got everyone in the room. We committed to those review schedules to know that this could be done quickly. We committed to the toolbox of what could be included in these designs so that we weren't making those decisions after we had developed the plans. A clear recognition that equity was the focus of all of these projects. We were trying to link a bicycle network to transit and to jobs and community centers. And that was a number one focus of everything that we were doing in developing that network. We were also leveraging the community support that had already been built by the county staff. So we were piggybacking on county planned public meetings to talk about these sorts of projects. They already had the support of the community for other things and had a great working relationship. And they were able to better communicate with the public than a consultant coming in who really doesn't know all the, the team players. Um, and making sure that we were putting the money on the places where it mattered the most. We did do a little bit of signal upgrades. You can see uh, the concrete island here that served as also um, bike parking, but we tried to keep the material selection to the things that would cost the least while being effective. Um, MassDOT has another really great example. This was a partnership with the Bar Foundation, um, where the Bar Foundation was sort of putting the money forward to help um, with the implementation of some of these projects. They um, helped to get the consultants on board. The consultants helped to identify the projects and sort of work through the design process. Um, and one other innovative thing I wanted to mention with this program is they sort of leveraged the state procurement process to get 
um, better bid prices for some of those items. That can be a real challenge with smaller projects that you try and put that out to bid in a traditional sense and you end up getting really high unit prices. But if you can piggyback on statewide procurement contracts, you can help to bring the cost of these projects down and be able to make that money go a whole lot further. And then the last one here is the um, People Streets program. This is a uh, program that was funded uh, by LA Metro. Um, it provided grant funding to the LA DOT to hire consultants to bring the technical experience to the community group. So this went out to all 15 council districts. The consultants assisted with um, applying for the programs. And if your program was actually accepted, the consultants would help with designing and permitting as well as the whole implementation strategy. Um, and this really was fairly quick, simple details, didn't take a whole lot of effort, but had um, fairly impactful benefit for the community to do all the different types of projects they were trying to do, whether that was crosswalks, painted intersections, parklets, or plazas. Um, so a really great success story to look to as a good example. Um, and with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you had. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, that was a really great presentation. Um, so we have had quite a few questions come in. So I'm going to bounce around and hopefully we can try and get to all of them. But if we don't get to all of them, um, please uh, follow up with us and send us your question because we'll definitely be able to answer it by email as well. So um, I'm going to start with one that I think is really important. Um, this is from Jessica. Any implementation design strategies for locations where a slow street starts at an intersection with an arterial slash collector? So I'm not sure who wants to take that one, but maybe Jeremy or Gwen, if you have ideas for where slow street, so local residential meets up with a larger volume street. So to, to some degree, I think this really depends on what the network of those streets really consists of. We've seen these sorts of implementations happen where you actually end up changing the road and adding a diverter so that traffic is only coming into the arterial. And in order to access that road, you would have to have some other connection on the backside. This really helps to achieve those goals of the volume and the speed, while you can still provide um, two-way access for bicycles. And frankly, we've even seen them implemented with two-way traffic for motor vehicles. If it's a residential street, you can come in from one direction, pull into your driveway. And then when you pull out of your driveway, you can still go um, either way, but it's sort of dead end. So, um, it, it does it does matter if your street is connected and you have more of a, a grid network or um, the only other real strategies are um, to tighten up the corner radius and slow the uh, through traffic or slow the, the turning speeds and then consider signing it as local traffic only. Um, how enforceable that is, is um, questionable. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy, for that answer. Um, okay, next question is from Rochelle. When converting a pilot slow street to something more permanent, like quick build, how can we address diversion concerns without a large traffic study? And I, I also have a uh, kind of more legislative answer to that, but I don't know if Jeremy or Gwen or Jessica, if you have thoughts on this. Um, you know, that, that's one of those ones where I like to ask that, that specific question during the kickoff meeting and have the city or, you know, localities traffic engineer in the room to identify what's really going to be required. Sometimes you can take sort of a no nonsense approach of we know these roads, we, we know that this intersection or this street can uh, accommodate the diversion and they don't really require a, a more in-depth analysis. Other locations, you're going to want to, you know, do that actual traffic study and then 
to what degree you need to um, review that also needs to be discussed with the traffic engineer. But, um, you know, the, the city traffic engineer tends to know what the conditions of roadways are and where they have a little bit of capacity and where they don't. Um, it's just a matter of finding out what, what you're gonna have to do for your specific project. That's a great answer. And um, I just wanna add that um, Senate Bill 288, at least in California, um, may or may not provide some exemptions for improvements in adopted uh, bike plans. So um, I would recommend that you go out and take a look at that piece of uh, recent legislation as well. Um, okay, next question is, wondering about outreach strategies in smaller communities where installations are on residential streets where there aren't active community groups or gathering places. So this is more of an outreach question. So one thing to always consider is neighborhood flyers and mailers. You know, it's a super simple way of getting information into the hands of the people that live on a smaller residential street. And um, whether you're hand delivering that or sending them in the mail, um, both of those can be effective. Um, also, you know, many communities do have a, uh, neighborhood listserv or use those sorts of um, ways to communicate and you can distribute information in uh, via that method uh, and then I you know I'll kick this over to Gwen and Jess to hear if they have um, other examples. Yeah I think that those the on the ground on street stickers could could be a good solution as well they're pretty low um low impact in the initial it could be they could be used as a fyi or as a you know tell us what you think type of thing so that could be one form to do it i think similar to what jeremy said utilizing um existing networks whether they're you know they're facebook groups next door groups it sounds silly but those those definitely are places where communities are engaging with each other um and so i think that getting the information out there in in those ways could be another one um jess i think i'll bounce that to you for a full round off i mean i think that that kind of covers it the i will say that it really does feel like people are very used to looking for stickers on the ground right now given the prevalence of them for spacing out in queuing um so i i think that those have been pretty excellent and the interface um the back and forth texting is is quite simple. Um, they're not getting a lot of information, but it's an opportunity to engage and ask kind of those core questions that you would want to get at. Great. Um, next question: Are there any data on the frequency of flex post delineators needing replacement due to being hit? I'm concerned for our rural county where our resources are limited on replacing slash repairing these delineators in a timely manner. Yes. Um, if you look at the city of Portland's separated bike lane design guide, I know Roger Geller put a number in there and it's, it's a fairly high number of percentage to be replaced every six months. I think I think the way he said it was, it's conservative, but we want to build that those dollars into our budget. Um, I'm not going to remember what the percentage is, but if you look in that guide, you'll find it. Um, it, it is something that you have to consider um, th that if you're going to put these posts in, they will eventually get struck just like the you know, in, in, in street pedestrian crossing signs. They're sort of a, a band-aid to get us along until we can do a more permanent installation, but they are effective. Um, you know, a, a driver of a vehicle really doesn't want to strike them. Um, so you, you tend to find that it's the larger vehicles, if the intersection was designed so that they couldn't turn around that corner, they'll end up clipping them. And those are the ones at the corners that tend to need to be replaced with any sort of regularity. But it also means that you're gonna see which ones do get struck and which ones don't. Um, and when you go back to replace them, 
you can make some minor adjustments and and see if it helps to address that issue. So in theory, the number that's getting struck should go down over time if you're making minor tweaks. Um, but there there will always be a little bit of a replacement cost there. Uh, that's great. Um, maybe we can get that resource, that Portland resource from you as well, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what about collision liability issues for standalone planters used as lane dividers? So this is a liability question. <laughs> So I'm not aware of any liability issues. Um, engineers like to look at the Ashto roadside design guide. So that's usually the resource that I turn to to identify when and where we can install things along a roadway. Um, and sort of a simple summary to look at is FHWA's Achieving Multimodal Networks Guide. And in there, we talked a lot about what types of treatments can be installed along roadways of different types. The short answer is any road that's 35 miles an hour or less um, doesn't necessarily have the same issues as a higher speed roadway. And what the all these guides will tell you is that the presence of these sorts of vertical objects along a roadway may be appropriate for the context of a road and may communicate to a driver that this is a place where they're not supposed to be driving quickly. So um, you do want to consider if that um, planter is struck, what, you know, what material is it made of? Um, I think the, the word is frangible, is the, the planter frangible? Um, but in terms of liability, I've, I've not seen any uh, issues of liability for installation of a planner on a road of an appropriate context. And I'll say we recently did um, a quick research review about uh, separators between in-street dining and travel lanes um, for MTC. And uh, it was pretty clear in looking at the guidelines that various cities have put out that it is exactly what Jeremy said. You know, a lot of places for those installations are setting a, a, a speed threshold. Um, and it's not so much identifying the actual material of, uh, of that separator, um, but really looking to being very context sensitive um, in what's approved. Great. Um, so I think we just have one last question that I, I'm gonna try and get to. Um, and then we'll close it out. Are there pilot projects or program examples of integrating climate resiliency benefits and drainage benefits with hard and slow street treatments? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I can't think of much. I mean, I, I can say, I know that we, I've talked to, high level about how do we get more stormwater stuff into pop-up projects, demonstration projects in general. And it's always just been a bit of a challenge because there's infrastructure that can't be done temporarily. Um, but I think that, I mean, DPAVE would be a group to potentially look to. Um, they focus on depaving asphalt and turning it into green space and stormwater. And I know that they've been doing that on um, pretty quick scale. I think it requires, um, often requires working with private property and not necessarily public property. Um, but I think that that could be a good, um, they could be a good group to look to in terms of coordinate, like pro projects that they've done um, and looking at their process to get those done quickly. Yeah, I'm not aware of like pop-up type or rapid build projects that generally try to include Green Street infrastructure. The city of Austin, Texas, um, as part of their bond measure, they basically make a whole lot of field construction decisions and they will incorporate Green Street in infrastructure where it looks like it'll be feasible, but that still has to go through the formal drainage design process, just like any sort of capital improvement project. And that's that's sort of the challenge with some of these Green Street infrastructure projects is you still, you need to know what's underground and you need to know if you're putting under drain in, how you're gonna make all those connections and all the sort of engineering decisions that go along with Green Street infrastructure. 
Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question. And I'm wondering, you know, if there's sort of any research out there um, on at least trying to quantify it in the quick build sense. So I think that's something for at least me to research further as we move, move along in this uh, trajectory. So um, with that, um, again, thank you to our panelists for this wonderful presentation and um, all the questions they answered today. Again, if you didn't get your question answered, um, please, please email me. Um, I think it's the next slide. Uh, it has my email on it. I'm there, there at the bottom, Nicholas Chabot. Um, so please follow up with me. We'll send out uh, a copy of the presentation to everyone who is registered today. Um, again, if you are interested in funding opportunities and or curating more quick build projects, please reach out to Toshi and I, um, especially in terms of the safe and seamless quick strike uh, opportunity that's coming up um, with the OBEG2 funds. And then in addition, um, we'll also uh, be having a quick build uh, bench um, that we are setting up. Uh, for local agencies in the region that can tap into our local expertise. So um, those are all pretty exciting things. And thank you so much for joining us um, today on this Monday morning. Um, and I hope everyone has a great holiday season. And please keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>